We're really pleased to be with all of you today. And we will begin the seminar, <clears throat> the discussion by providing an update on the US-China business relations from each of our vantage points. So I will begin looking at the macro political economy aspects of, of what I see happening right now. So sadly, the news is not so great. Um, both economies are in serious trouble and that's adding to tensions that already exist in the bilateral relationship. And this of course doesn't help um, companies or anyone else that's trying to do good work between the two, two countries. Now, the two economies grew very nicely in tandem with a lot of complementarities in the last three plus decades. But after 2008, the financial crisis really changed that and that trajectory and that equation. And so we've been dealing with the fallout from that really ever since. Um, but now with the corona, things are really much worse than they were even before. And they're changing again in ways where, that are not entirely predictable, I would say, and that are not in anyone's benefit, at least at the moment. Um, I would note, however, that these trends that we're seeing, some of these tensions and other trends, really began before COVID. They began before even President um, Trump came to office or even before President Xi came to office. So the, um, the current situation, uh, I'm gonna look at it from China's perspective first and from the US perspective second, and just see some of the similarities that, that um, emerge. But behind this, the both economies are dealing with serious economic problems, but there tends to be this blame game as well that one is blaming the other. And, um, and so the, the political risk has really grown in the process. Uh, but from China's point of view, we can see since 2007 with the financial crisis in the beginning, that economic growth has been falling pretty steadily. And initially there was a lot of discussion about, well, is it a cyclical change that, that will be recovered? And the answer basically looks like no, that it's structural and that there's um, you know, a lot of issues that China has to deal with um, as well. Now, from China's point of view, they talk a lot about the, these three major challenges, the financial crisis, the trade, um, war with the US and now with, with uh, the virus, the COVID-19. Um, so e with each of these issues, there's a lot of blaming the US. And, and of course, there's some of it is valid, but they look at these three um, problems and say, you know, the US has, has been not helpful at the, at, the, at the minimum in trying to, to deal with this. So in 2007, 2008, China used a major stimulus to try to get um, beyond it. And you can see there's a little bump after in 2009, 2010, but a major stimulus that, that has also increased the debt. Um, and there's been then the trade war, and so they've had a lot of policies to, to deal with that, to try to mitigate that from um, and help China's growth, and then now COVID-19 as well. Um, so the policymakers have, have tried very hard to manage growth in China um, so that it wouldn't have so-called hard, uh, hard landing um, and they have been really quite successful with that uh, until now. So this is the last quarter, the first quarter of 2020. But you can see the reality is under President Xi's watch, growth in China has been falling consistently. And now, of course, it, it's crashed. So 
I'm sure he's feeling a lot of political pressure as a result of that and trying to figure out um, what to do next. Now, if we look at the situation from the U.S.'s perspective, and we look at annual growth, of course, the financial crisis was a major blow to the economy, and our policymakers have tried to, to maintain growth and promote growth at between 1% and 3%, and we've been fairly successful at that, um, until, of course, the first quarter of 2020, where our economy fell about 4.8%, but the second quarter will be much larger decrease than that. That's what's predicted. But it's interesting. So when we look at our challenges, we also look at the financial crisis, the trade war with China, and the virus. So we have this, again, kind of this tandem relationship with China. Um, at the same time, what it, the behind the trade war is issues about China's exports and China's trade policies, et cetera. And so if we look at what's happened since 1979, when China opened up with reforms, the trade slowly grew um, with the opening and also foreign investment. But the big uh, change in trajectory really came when China joined the WTO and then had access to markets around the world. And that um, has caused a lot of pressure on other countries, in, including the US, and a lot of reaction that China was successful in these exports, but that many countries felt that they were really importing too much and it wasn't fair trade and, and et cetera. But it's interesting that if you look at US exports, um, and this is since 1992, we've also, our exports have grown really very well. Some ups and downs because of the various uh, recessions, et cetera. But basically at this point in time, the US and China export approximately the same amount, two and a half trillion dollars per year. Um, but we also import a lot more than China does, right? So this trade deficit, um, picture is kind of the background of the Trump uh, administration's policies and, and concerns with vis-a-vis -vis, um, China. So, so the U.S. has many concerns related to China and trade is only one of them. So behind the trade is also the supply chain issue and how vulnerable certain sectors in the U.S. may be to that supply chain. Um, uh, distribution and the technology competition that has emerged as well as the military buildup. So to, to sum up this, this introduction, overall, the overall paradigm that has been built since normalization of relations with China between the U.S. and China has been to work with China on common interests and support the country's development and modernization. And that was seen as being in the interest of the US. But right now, this is undergoing a major reevaluation and concrete change that's going to affect businesses. But frankly, it's going to affect everyone, you know, our students, our research, our nonprofits, our government institutions. And the presidential uh, election that we're that's coming up in the US right now is, is will amplify that debate and exacerbate those already strained relations, uh, I'm, I'm afraid. So on that note, I will turn it over to Cecilia. Thank you, Penny, and thank you so much for uh, setting up the conversation. So my research is on uh, global strategies of emerging market firms with a particular focus in China and the greater China area. So I'm very happy to join the panel and share my point of view. Um, so today, let me just share my screen here. So today um, I'm going to focus on startups and venture capital investments in China. So um, since the outbreak of COVID-19 in China, we have seen a drastic decrease in terms of the uh, 
aggregated level of investment in new business. So in terms of the uh, amount of venture capital investment, I mean, in both the brand new business and also in startups that relatively are in the profitable stage, um, we are looking at anywhere at around 60% of decline in the first quarter of 2020. So if you are looking at this chart here, um, it shows a number of um, venture capital and private equity firms that actually made investments in the first quarter of 2020. And the number was uh, 17, uh, 788. So compared to the number of venture capital firms that made investment in the last quarter of 2019, we are talking about a 44% of reduction. And if we look at the seed stage investment, investments in the startups that just get started and barely have any economy of scale or so, those typically, you know, um, they, they totally disappear in China during the first quarter of 2020. There were less than 20 deals happening in total, representing a roughly 86% reduction year on year basis. So in other words, jobs in China um, are solving for VC financing now. Um, next, if I can show you this graph, you see that the entrepreneurial activities of financing has been concentrated in the coastal areas in China, uh, notably the Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangdong provinces. When I say Guangdong provinces, they're Shenzhen and Guangzhou in particular. And it is unsurprising that the provinces with the greatest investment reduction are the places that are affected by the virus the most, namely Hubei province and Hunan province. Um, but I also want to um, share some interesting and maybe even promising trends here, although, you know, uh, Penny shared some bad news and we all know that we are plagued with bad news happening. Um, there are five sectors that stand out in terms of receiving the most amount of venture capital funding in China. And these five sectors are, one, the education and training, second, e-commerce, three, media and entertainment, four is healthcare, and the fifth is artificial intelligence and robotics. So take medical care, for instance. Out of the 788 uh, VC firms that made investment in the first quarter that I talked about just now, um, 265 venture capital firms invested in the healthcare sector. So that's about, we're talking about 33, 34% of them. And they raised a total of 1,700 million US dollars for uh, startups in this sector. Although this amount of uh, venture capital investments are skewed significantly less than uh, what we have seen one year ago, it is the sector with the highest amount of venture capital investments right now in China. Another sector that I would like to bring you, uh, bring to your attention is the education and training sector. Um, so it is the only sector in China that we see growth in terms of venture capital investment. So as you can see it here, um, probably due to the shelter in place directives, um, most of the parents are trying to engage with their kids, right, uh, with these online learning tools. So there we have a total of $1.24 billion of investments in the online education. And then we are talking about a close to 40% year-on-year growth in the first quarter of 2020. So that's the general outlook of the startup and the venture capital investments in China during the past several months. And now I'll pass on to Lian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my research has been on uh, the, influence, the influence of culture on behavior and uh, social interactions. So one of the recent, most recent groundbreaking research about culture is that um, 
the is a the research by Michelle Gelfand and her team about culture tightness and looseness. Um, tightness means um, you have a society has strong cultural norm, and uh, um, uh, or social they emphasize social order, uh, self control, discipline, and punish. Um, deviant behaviors. Uh, loose cultures are those value freedom, um, tolerance, and uh, innovation. Um, of course, so what influences cultural tightness are, can be population density, historical um, uh, conflict and media control, um, a lot of uh, historical religion um, factors. So you can see that this is, um, uh, it's a, of course, there are lots of uh, factors that influence uh, the COVID cases and casualty, uh, but it's just a curious um, pattern that we can observe from the tightness to, I just give a few examples, and these are data I, I took from the internet a few, a few days ago. You can see there seem to be uh, correlation between tightness and uh, casualty rates. Um, of course, there are lots of other factors like healthcare systems um, influence the uh, COVID uh, cases, uh, but it's an in interesting, uh, curious pattern that we can observe about a society's cultural norm and uh, how, how, how the society is managing this crisis. Um, there are, um, the author Michelle Gelfand, she has uh, recently uh, wrote an op-ed saying maybe the U.S. Um, is time to tighten up, that can maybe some, some tight, tight uh, norms may help dealing with the crisis. Um, there, are, there are also scores about uh, the 50 states of the U.S. and the 31 provinces of China on their tightness and looseness um, norms. Uh, so it's an interesting angle for us to look at um, the societal, the cultural factors that might influence the situation. Um, a lot of, uh, um, that's the book of, called Rule Makers and Rule Breakers, How Tight and Loose Cultures Survive Our World. Um, highly recommend. Um, in China, um, a lot of this book called Anti-Fragile, it has been very popular among Chinese colleagues. Um, and then in the research about intercultural uh, studies and communication, uh, culture influence, and there's some, a lot of interesting research about intercultural rhetoric analysis about conflict escalation in the trade talks and a lot of other uh, communications. Um, there are some recent research also, I guess, related to the anti-fragile um, sentiment is about uh, resilience and responsibility, responsible uh, leadership. And I'm a uh, guest editing a special issue about humanistic leadership. I guess in crisis, we all, we still, we, um, have special need for benevolence, for care for people. So that's the direction um, some uh, research in my area. Now back to Penny. Okay, well, we're gonna stay with Leanne for the next uh, uh, round, but some comments on how the current situation is affecting companies doing business in China or Chinese companies doing business in the US. And we'll start with Leanne. Okay share again. Um, I know my colleagues will have a lot more numbers, so let me give you a case. Uh, that's a case about pandas. Um, pandas are also impacted by the pandemic, especially Arshun and Da Mao. Those are their pictures. Um, they're in the Calgary Zoo. Um, because of the pandemic, they could not get imported fresh bamboos um, so the, unfortunately, um, they eat a lot of bamboos. Each panda eats about 88 pounds fresh bamboos per day. That's 99% of their diet. Um, 
So this, um, unfortunately, they have to go back to China early uh, because of the shipment, the disruptions in the global supply chain to get their food supplies. So it's a force majeure from the, um, um, for the pandas in their food supply. Uh, but how the pandas got into the Calgary Zoo, and before that in the uh, Toronto Zoo, there's some interesting um, in, uh, negotiation cases going on is between the Chinese and the Canadians. Um, they appear to be just between the zoos or the government, but in fact, there are lots of other stakeholders indirectly involved in the negotiations that are um, have power and influence in the negotiations, and they are obviously also impacted by the pandemic too. Uh, for example, during the negotiations, um, a Chinese-Canadian community leader, he's a physician and trustee of the Toronto Zoo, who played a very important role, intermediate role, um, in the negotiations. And uh, um, the, the corporate sponsors also um, play important role in these kind of negotiations. For example, PetroChina at that time was um, wanted to invest in the oil sand project in uh, Alberta. They were waiting for the Canadian government um, approval. Uh, FedEx, of course, runs the Panda Express um, and uh, Home Depot also were involved in the talks about helping renovate and expand um, the uh, enclosures for the pandas. Um, the negotiation was announced by prime minister in state, um, state visit, um, and then um, for long-term collaborations on research. So uh, pandas, not just, they're not just, uh, um, adorable creatures and they also um, involve their traveling, they involve uh, their um, international exchange involves a trade specialists, political uh, lobbies and environmental groups and animal rights activists, they all have opinions about these cases and the pandemic obviously also influence um, them as well. Um, so it's not just the finance, not just about um, learning uh, for children, but also it's an important case that influence uh, international relations. I guess this is a snapshot uh, for the pandemic influence that I give you. Now I pass on to Celia. Um, so in terms of foreign investments in China, we did see significant reductions in the past several months. Um, it is worth noting, however, that um, the venture, uh, venture capital market, at least, seems to remain confident to foreign investment. In fact, foreign venture capital firms raised $8.8 billion during the past March and April, which is about 67% of the total funds raised in China during the two months. And um, in the spirit of sharing cases, I would also like to talk about a case that uh, has been proven to be quite successful in terms of managing multiple stakeholder relationships um, in China. If I could just share my slide here, it's uh, Amazon that I would like to talk about. Um, so Amazon, uh, for instance, they partner with Dream Team Incubator uh, back in the year in March 2013. Um, so they do so to connect uh, with the local startups. Dream Team Incubator is an independent entrepreneurial team that aligns with their strategic goals with the government's agenda to support startups. So in this collaboration, Amazon Web Service, the AWS, will support the, the program, the startups that are involved in the program with their cloud services, with their digital techniques, and also the training resources. And at the same time, the local company Dream Team will be handling the day-to-day -day, uh, operations. So uh, we are seeing that this collaboration is actually very helpful for, startup, uh, for Amazon 
to show their commitment to the local market and also reduce the liability of outsidership and foreigners. And I see this as particularly critical given the, um, the current situation and the tension between the Chinese and the US uh, relationship. So Dream Team was actually only the first incubator that Amazon formed uh, collaborations with. Later on, um, Amazon further expanded their investment with other innovation centers in Chongqing and Qingdao as well. So throughout these various collaborations, Amazon was able to maintain very close relationships with more than 200 leading Android or venture capital firms in China. They were also able to draw a large and various resources, pool of resources and expertise in areas such as financing, technology, investment, and even government relationships. So taking from there, uh, the good news came in March 2020. So Amazon Web Service Marketplace China became officially available in Ningxia and Beijing. Um, so the office was set up in Ningxia and Beijing in March 2020. So now uh, users or customers around the world can log into their AWS accounts and to quickly launch these pre-configured uh, softwares. So, but even without having an account in AWS, we can still search products based on categories, vendors, pricing plans, and delivery methods. And the websites are available both in English and the Chinese version. So I think this is an excellent example to show where multinational enterprises, foreign firms, they strategically align their business with the government's um, agenda and to create, possibly more importantly, to capture value for both the local stakeholders and their own shareholders. Yeah, I think that's all uh, I would like to share for now and I would like to pass on to Penny. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Well, that, it's a great example of resilience of the relationship and um, I think so far we are seeing quite a lot of resilience in terms of uh, companies saying that they're going to stay in China. Some companies are actually going to move to China, but there are some of course that are thinking about diversification of supply chains and as well as markets um, or do the China plus one kind of strategy where you at least have one alternative supplier um, for the, the critical parts that, that you need. But based on recent surveys by the American Chamber of Commerce in China, many, many companies are staying and even plan to, to expand. Um, now, uh, that's on one side. The other side in terms of trade has really taken a, a, a big hit and that's partly because of the trade war, but tariffs, et cetera but now also because of the virus and some of these supply chains are breaking down. Um, but it looks like foreign direct investment from the US to China has, has been pretty steady. And, and right now we don't know what will happen in the rest of 2020, but it's been, been pretty steady and, and even. What hasn't been resilient is Chinese investment in the US. That has fallen off a cliff for a whole variety of reasons. Um, largely based on U.S. policy that's discouraging certain kinds of Chinese investment, especially in high-tech um, industries. So that's, that's a, a, a big change in, in the trends. So let's move to what are the opportunities that we can see out of, out of all this um, and any suggestions that we have for companies um, going forward given this large uncertainty that, that, that we're facing. And so we'll, we'll start with Cecilia. Thank you, Penny. Um, and I would like to reckon what you said that, you know, uh, it's a challenge for sure for uh, startups, for instance, and venture capital investments and foreign investments in China and even uh, global marketplace. But at the same time, I would also encourage us to think about it as uh, an opportunity for transformation. 
So uh, again, I will come back to the startups. And I think at this point of time, it's really important for them to consolidate their existing investments, to restructure their management, management um, and to think about long-term strategies. They need to uh, consider the previous financial investments as some cost if needed, and really be very aggressive in terms of cost control. Um, they also met, they need to effectively manage the risk by maybe diversifying their assets. Um, to many Chinese uh, startups, they are managed and owned by the families. So I think um, in coping with the current crisis, it's important to, for them to separate the ownership and the control. The family owners need to acknowledge that uh, it's their responsibility to pay close attention to what's happening in the business and call out issues when they see them. But at the same time, uh, the family owners also need to allow those professional managers to run the business. Um, and also at this time, uh, the stakeholders, the external stakeholders, they are eager to look for narratives. So I think it's also important for the family business to send out a very clear message about, for instance, key information, so liquidity, dividends, valuations, et cetera. Although transportation, uh, transparency is not always the cup of tea for family firms. So it, but it becomes critical to, to align interests and remain uh, resilient and sustainable during the crisis. Um, second, I would like to talk about the importance for startups to capture this opportunity for transformation by leveraging on technologies. So I will show, I will share my screens here. Um, so China has seen very fast growth in terms of digital technologies, like in social media, crowdsourcing, data, data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, so and so forth, during the past years. Uh, marketing in China in particular has integrated the digital technologies. We see Chinese consumers are very tech savvy and they are very comfortable with the online shopping. So with the cheap, cheap breath, uh, broadband and a dynamic online landscape, um, the businesses will need to leverage on these digital technologies to, to capture opportunities to thrive. Um, in fact, the five sectors that I mentioned uh, in the first question that attracted the most amount of venture capital investment, including the education, the e-commerce, the, um, the media, healthcare and uh, artificial intelligence. All of these five to the sectors are in one way or another related to digital technologies. So take the medical and healthcare sector for, for example. Artificial intelligence has been applied to enhance the patient healthcare, um, accessibility and lifestyle management, and also uh, it serves to improve clinical outcomes and operational effectiveness. Uh, patients are simply reported to be happier with the access of these digital technologies. Um, and in terms of new um, value creation, I think startups need to shift their focus from production of product center or focus on the product development to focusing on customer or user development. So in other words, they need to develop a user-centric or fan-based network that really is the breathing ground for, uh, for opportunities uh, for domestic and even international expansion. Capability building and rapid capab capability building is the key here also during such a transformation. So I think uh, in terms of startups and but SMEs at large, they can consider collaborating with new research institutes, universities, and attract returnees from developed countries, uh, such as from US, to uh, see for possible means to accelerate this, uh, this process. So the last thing I would like to highlight is the role of government in the private sectors. Um, I would like to highlight the role of uh, government-guided funds. So uh, in the context of China, the past two decades, I would say, have seen 
drastic growth of the government-backed uh, VCs, what we also call it the government-guided funds. So these funds act as a matchmaker that brings the promising entrepreneurial opportunities, promising startups with uh, the private venture capital firms together. So um, the government-guided funds usually will contribute anything between 40 to 50% of the total venture capital investment. And they serve uh, to support these early stage or seed stage startups and typically the startups in the high tech industry. So for instance, uh, in March 2020, the Gray Bay Area Investment Fund was established. So the scale of these regional fund is 422 million US dollars. It is an important measure to promote the local economy, especially firms in the local area. I mean, in the Guangdong, Macau and Hong Kong areas. So both foreign and local startup investments can consider leveraging on these opportunities to collaborate with the government guided funds to reduce the risk to gain government support and also to capture the opportunities. So just to wrap up with uh, my, my um, thoughts on this question, I think in total there will be a bounce back um, across industries after the outbreak in China. So um, SMEs need to reflect on how to seize the next wave of growth by taking timely or even radical uh, measures. Now I'll pass on to uh, Lian. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, an anti-suggestion. Uh, this is a research done by uh, with Betty Fong and Yoshi Song, the pen on the listening to. Um, so we find that uh, parochialism is a cognitive barrier, especially for Chinese firms of globalization and intercultural collaboration. So parochialism includes close-mindedness, uh, incognition, uh, self-protection behaviors, and in-group uh, focused relationships. Um, then um, my, some of the other research shows that um, professionalism, well, we look at Chinese and American in comparative studies in inter and intracultural negotiations. Uh, we find that um, in terms of uh, building trust, Chinese overly rely on affected trust, meaning I like you, I trust you because we're from the same hometown or um, there is some similar, we're connected. Americans rely, overly rely on cognitive trust, meaning uh, trust based on experience, credentials, and uh, uh, credibilities. Uh, but because of Chinese rely too much on effective trust, they can easily be uh, emotionally deceived. So they're more susceptible to emotional deception. Um, and Americans over rely on cognitive trust. They're easily deceived by informational deception. Um, so what we need in intercultural interactions is that for Chinese need to build more professionalism, um, using credibilities, using credentials uh, to build trust and dis, um, detect deceptions. Americans, on the other hand, in professional settings, you probably need to build more warm and fuzzy uh, relationships and emotions that can help in these situations. Um, in my teachings of, uh, I use, when I use global virtual teams with master's students um, and with intense international exchange, they always find that we're actually more similar than different, than we're different. So in mm -hmm. interactions definitely will help. Um, another suggestion would be to build ex um, 
um, bridge the value divide with commonality in global coalitions. Uh, recently, um, we all know that Mark Zuckerberg went out of his way to develop re relationships with China, Chinese leadership and business communities uh, in order for Facebook to enter China. He recently just said, there seem to be very different value systems between China and the US. Uh, so we need to bridge the value divide with some common platform. For example, the Global Compact for Sustainability, uh, there are over uh, 9,000 companies of members, including a lot of Chinese companies. Um, so these are, uh, some, there are some global platforms that can help us uh, build commonality, common ground. Um, finally, I will just show you back to Panda. Um, it's just <laughs> a few of my favorite things um, that Kung Fu Panda is a Hollywood production, um, but talking about the Chinese, the Panda stories, but it's about more um, universal themes, so inner peace, identity and community. Um, the violin concerto called Butterfly, um, uh, concert, Butterfly Lovers Concerto is based on the Chinese folk, folk story, more like a Romeo and Juliet, uh, but it's composed by Chinese musicians um, to talk about using the Western instrument of violin to, to tell the story, the universal, the universal theme of love and love transcendence. And uh, uh, finally, um, the Starbucks mooncakes is a creation um, based on the traditional Chinese mooncakes, but with fabulous new delicious flavors of mangoes and raspberries. So mm. these are products out of intercultural synergy, engagement, and collaborations. We need more of these. There are plenty of opportunities for this. I don't think the efforts will stop. Um, but we need more of these and not decoupling. So back to Penny. Great, thank you, Leanne. Um, one other thought before we move on to the Q&A. Um, there are these different levels of analysis. And if we think about what he, the different policies, the states in the US, for example, are very welcoming, many of them, of foreign investment, whereas the national policies tend to be much more hesitant. And then if we look at people to people relations and company to company relations, if we can manage those cross cultural challenges and build trust has has built really what I hope are resilient connections uh, between the two countries that will survive this this current situation of the pandemic as well as the tensions that have arised. Um, so based on that, uh, we'll pass it back to Tamir. Thank you so much, Penny. What a great panel. Lots of great ideas here. I'll certainly be using the record recording uh, of this, this session with my students. But uh, And we have limited time. There's a lot of good questions. Uh, and I promise that we'll keep track of these questions. And perhaps our panels will be able to address them uh, with participants later on. But we have uh, Trevor Williams with us. Uh, Trevor is the uh, Global Atlanta uh, editor, publisher, uh, and he's an enthusiast uh, of China. He travels there, uh, speaks uh, pretty good Chinese too, uh, my friends tell me. So Trevor, if you could share some uh, reflections uh, and, and some thoughts on, on what we have heard this, this morning. Yeah, thanks, Tamir. I really appreciate you <coughs> having me on. And uh, I guess the main focus I would have is on the sort of local environment. That's that's what I report on, given <coughs> our focus at Global Atlanta on the interplay between the global economy and the local environment. And I think uh, if we if I point to some of my recent reporting, it might help uh, elucidate some of the concepts that were being talked about uh, by our esteemed panelists. Um, one thing that I found interesting recently uh, is uh, watching the the, the uh, reaction of Georgia companies that have significant operations in China. So, uh, for instance, and, and it's really run the gamut uh, from optimistic to, to pessimistic, um, and depending on the sector. It, it seems to me that uh, those that have manufacturing in China 
um, that have put a lot of fixed capital investment into China are, are staying the course. Um, and there was one company that I wrote about called Anisa International that makes makeup brushes and has just opened a new factory in Tianjin uh, really right when the pandemic began. So some of uh, the resilience of the Chinese, or, or the, I guess the, the quickness of the Chinese response to the pandemic and um, their ability to kind of get factories back online was really praised by a lot of these companies. Uh, at the same time, you know, our Penny, our buddies at East West Manufacturing are seeing a lot of, um, a lot of inquiries about, um, you know, this China plus one strategy and uh, people trying to figure out how do they diversify away from just relying so much on China. Um, and in particular, countries like India and uh, Malaysia and others are seeing some um, uptick in interest based on um, based on the this sort of new trend, but also existing trend of uh, companies looking beyond China based on the trade war and now the, the coronavirus response. Um, you know, of course, Delta has an investment in, in China Eastern Airlines. Um, so that's, I'm sure that's hurting right now. Um, Agco, uh, which is a Georgia-based company, has factories in China. Coca-Cola was one of the, the the first to reopen. Actually, probably never closed, I think, in China. They were one of the few factories, uh, the few uh, foreign companies in particular that were allowed to keep producing within China uh, during even, even throughout the thick of the pandemic. Uh, but then, you know, some of the, on, on this side of the, the world, I think it's been interesting to watch uh, the response by our politicians, even uh, preceding uh, the pandemic, we saw um, Georgia shutting down, well, not shutting down, but refocusing its its foreign investment recruitment office in China. I wrote about that. Um, I've written about that pretty extensively. Uh, there was a big tire manufacturing facility here that was uh, called off, uh, presumably because of, partially because of trade tensions. And then um, now more recently, I think some of the China skeptics have been emboldened by rhetoric at the top of the U.S. government. Um, so we've seen Georgia's U.S. Senator Kelly Leffler being uh, extremely anti-China in her comments, and that seems to be indicative of a larger trend, uh, which is prevalent in any election year. <laughs> China bashing is a time-honored tradition in election years, but it seems like now there's this, there's been this, uh, like Penny said, reframing of the relationship into a more competitive mode rather than cooperative, and that seems to bode uh, negatively in, in terms of um, long-term collaboration. Um, on technology, again, I'm, I'm very skeptical that there's any real common ground there, especially with the US um, blacklisting Huawei and um, using really technology industry as a, as a tool uh, for its uh, objectives in challenging China. Um, there's been a lot of use, as Penny said, of um, the, C the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US or CFIUS um, use of national security as uh, justifiably or not as a means of restricting Chinese investment. And I don't really see that changing and uh, particularly in this more competitive environment. So I, I don't really wanna keep talking because I know there's so many good questions out there. I guess um, some of the things that we didn't really hear um, I, that I would be interested in hearing more about would be sort of the Chinese or the, the future going forward, how does, this new consensus that seems to be brewing in the U.S. How does that? How can we, you know, frame it more constructively? Perhaps after the the presidential campaign is over, and really address some of the issues that people seem to agree uh, about, which is that China has, you know, in some ways benefited from the international system in a way that uh, has been unfair and that that it needs to be rectified. But uh, it seems to me that any constructive ways of dealing with that are kind of off the table at this point. We didn't really talk much about the phase one deal, uh, the trade deal that Trump uh, made with China seems to be threatened. He's had his own uh, skepticism about the deal mentioned recently in press conferences, though China seems to be on track um, in terms of some of its purchases, at least on the agricultural sector that it committed to. Um, we can argue whether that uh, framework was really correct in the first place, but and then uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong are interesting issues uh, to talk about, <laughs> very sensitive. But um, you know, Taiwan especially seems to be emboldened by uh, the U.S. support that it's been getting, and that seems to be potentially um, an inflammatory issue between the two sides. And of course, the Hong Kong national security law 
things like the uh, the oppression of the Uyghurs in Northwest China. I mean, there's just so many things that are um, in the background of this relationship that that can lead to um, further escalation of conflict. In addition to this idea that the coronavirus uh, has really shined a light on um, the different systems, uh, I think China wants to say that its response proves the validity of its system, and then the U.S. wants to point to the early missteps um, of the Chinese response as proof that closed societies are not the way to go, but each side has its arguments, and um, that, that to me doesn't seem to be going anywhere either. So um, in true journalist fashion, raising much, many more questions than answers here, but uh, <laughs> I just thought uh, I'd throw some of these things out there and, and hopefully get uh, some responses here, maybe let y'all address some of the audience questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. Uh, lots of issues there and, and very fluid, constantly changing as well. I mean, you mm. really have to bring multidisciplinary perspectives to study US-China relationships, not just economics, but political science, sociology, culture, like Leanne has done, and others as well. I mean, the issue of the declining pace of uh, Chinese investment in the United States uh, that Penny started talking about, I mean, uh, that's uh, almost not necessarily economy or economic rationale related, but political sentiments. Wouldn't you say so, Penny? I mean, much of the reason why we're seeing this decline is really the tension that you all talked about and, and negative feelings and, and perhaps uh, uh, a little bit of uh, patience uh, until after the, until the elections. Uh, perhaps some, some Chinese investors are waiting for what's going to happen in the US elections as well. Yeah, I mean, that certainly is a, an overlay of, of what's, of, of the dramatic decline, I think. But there's also policies within China that are affecting the outward investment in terms of access to foreign exchange and worried about, initially worried about capital outflow. And so all of these things kind of came together at once. Um, so you really do have to look at the specific situation in a specific sector. And is it a small company or a large company? Um, and some com Chinese companies are still continuing to invest here. So, you know, it is like, as you said, very fluid. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was one specific question about airlines. I mean, to what extent Chinese regulators is restricting U.S. airlines operations in China? Uh, is, that, is that the case? Uh, uh, because the claim is that Chinese airlines are free to operate in the United States right now. And so we're talking about the most recent few months here. Yeah, have well, you heard about anything about that? Well, I know the administration is is putting pressure on China to change the the rules, but I don't have any update on that at, at this moment. Mm -hmm. U.S. and China don't have an open skies agreement, so I think most routes that are developed have to be approved um, on the, on the U.S. DOT side. But that's all I really know about it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of questions here. Our, our colleague Giles uh, asks, what would it take for there to be a harmonious relationship between <laughs> China and the United States? And I think that's going to take time, first of all, yeah. and maybe a resolution of, uh, of various crises that you very nicely pointed. I mean, it's, it's a number of major uh, adverse effects uh, disasters, in a sense, happening all at the same time, getting in the way of uh, U.S.-China trade relationship. But uh, Tamir, uh, I, I would answer that just briefly and say that there are many people uh, in China who do not want the relationship to implode. Mm. And mm. I think that's also true in the U.S. So, but mm. if we think about the Chinese situation, you know, we've had we've had a very good relationship, and it's helped both economies do well. Um, and so the question is whether those people can get an upper hand in some sense, either in the U.S. or in China, and have some influence on policy. Mm -hmm. There there are many areas of mutual interest that we can build on. 
it's just right now this kind of blame game and tensions and lack of respect at the highest levels that I think are really putting a barrier uh, between, you know, in this discussion. Maybe a quick question of uh, perhaps uh, uh, for Cecilia, the, uh, the AWS Joint Incubator, it's also known as Jingdan Financial Incubation Space, is it? Uh, Milint asks, and, and why are there two different names? Uh, so I have to look further into that, but then what I'm seeing as I show it from the slides there, what they're, the, if, if we, I'm sure she's not talking about the AWS marketplace in China, right? But AWS. For the China, is it a mutual arrangement? Um, okay, maybe it's talking just about the incubator uh, part. Yeah. Okay, so well, it, it was another incubator collaboration that uh, Amazon formed before the AWS marketplace. Okay. And Jordi had to take into account both parties in their naming. But, Okay. It's a mutual agreement, I believe, and uh, I have to further look into the reason why they uh, end up yeah. with this agreement. This, this has been great. Uh, thank you so much. I'm actually certainly going to go back and view the recording and continue to learn and check some of the resources and Leanne's comment on the most recent research tightness issue, for example, uh, it's very, very inspiring. So with that, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Penny, Leanne, Cecilia, and of course, our guest commentators, uh, Trevor. Thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on another webinar uh, coming soon.